another episode of Jay Leno's Garage. We're here in the Duesenberg section of the garage. What we're going to look at today is the very last original owner, unrestored Duesenberg. Uh, it's been restored now. This is a rather long, arduous process. This is a car that was locked away in a uh, Manhattan parking garage in 1931. And really, not much happened until we pulled it out in 2005. In fact, there was a story about it in uh, Old Cars Weekly. See, it says Leno Land's last original unrestored Duesenberg. The sad thing is the car was pretty far gone. We couldn't leave it original. Remember when we pulled that Model X Duesenberg out of the barn here in California a number of years ago? Right here, take a look at that. Fortunately, that one just needed some mechanical updating, and it was okay. This car was a little too far gone. There was a bad leak in the garage in Manhattan, and for 60 years, or whatever, 70 years, water dripped on the rear fender and just ate it away, and it just needed a lot of work. Uh, when I got the car, it had 7,000 miles registering on the odometer. Once we got into it, we realized it was more like 107,000 miles. But it's a fascinating story. It was owned by the Strauss family. It was parked in that garage in 1931. I don't know why, maybe the depression, maybe it seemed a little too fancy, whatever it might have been. But it stayed there all those years. In the 50s, it was taken out by the sun up to a restoration shop to get it running again, and then essentially put back in the garage. So it kind of fell into uh, disrepair. Uh, tires were stored in the rear of it, so the original interior got kind of ruined from just 50 years of tires being put back there. She was a good old girl, and I was able to acquire it and uh, restore it back to its, uh, well, I think better than new. It was never a pretty car. This was a Woods-bodied car. Now, Woods was famous coach builder. They got famous because they built Lincoln's funeral carriage. So that shows you the kind of styling they were into. This is not by any means a pretty car or an attractive car. This is a big town car meant to chauffeur uh, wealthy people around New York City. Uh, the rumor has it uh, Herbert Hoover, when he was president, was often uh, a passenger in this car because the family obviously quite wealthy. Now, we did not do the restoration of this one here at the shop. Randy Ema. Uh, the Duesenberg uh, genius and historian who's done all the Duesenbergs. We don't touch the Duesenbergs because Randy knows them inside and out and uh, you know he knows how to save the original patina as much as possible. We updated the car a little bit. Randy uh, chromed the windshield frame. It was a big, ugly, black car. It wasn't very attractive. Uh, this opens up for the chauffeur. For some reason, I like, they love having the chauffeur out in the elements while everybody else uh, sat comfortably in the back. We keep this closed because I think it helps the line of the car more. Looks like a big box with this open, but you'll see all that. Uh, here's uh, some footage of Randy doing the restoration. This car is the last original owner unrestored Duesenberg. As you can see, it's all there, but everything has to be done. Every nut and bolt, every washer, every gasket, everything's got to be polished. The Duesenberg was transported from Jay's garage to Randy's shop. Here the journey began after a careful trip across town. We'll actually take it down to every last nut and bolt. We won't undo the rivets, but we will take every nut and bolt apart. And those nuts and bolts received as much care as every other part on the Duesenberg. In fact, in a restoration like this, the procedure is clear. Every piece is treated as though it's the most important aspect of the car. Soon they were freeing the gear from the body so they could get it stripped and ready for paint. It took a lot of time. Now, very slowly, let's, let's lower it down. There were no big surprises when we disassembled the car. Uh, we did take off about probably 35, 40 pounds of grit, grease, and dirt. For an Eastern car that was driven most likely on salty roads, it's an amazing shape. The, the grease may have been enough early enough on that it really protected it. There's very little rust, no damage to speak of at all. When that task was out of the way, the next major phase was all about sandblasting. Once completed, the sandblasting eliminated the last surface remnants of the old car. It erased the primer and paint of the previous decades, leaving the original bare metal exposed. From blasting to building a new wood top, this car requires many skills. These cars were built mostly from ash, 
and we use ash in the replacement pieces that go back in these automobiles. We're going to paint it like the factory would do if they were going to assemble it at the factory. But it wasn't done with lacquer. You can't even buy lacquer paint anymore. It's illegal in California. This paint job is going to sit for probably a couple of, uh, couple of weeks, and then we'll color sand it. Back at Randy Ema's shop, the mighty Duesenberg engine had to be rebuilt, retuned, and eventually reinstalled onto its fully restored chassis. 420 cubic inch, double overhead cam, straight eight, four valves per cylinder. It was run at Bonneville at 5,000 RPM with a supercharger that would develop 320 horsepower. This particular model is 265 horsepower, capable of 88 miles an hour in second gear when a 1929 Big 8 Chrysler would do 75 miles an hour flat out. And the car will do more than go fast. It'll look like a work of art, thanks to many newly chrome parts. And for those of you with sharp vision, know your eyes aren't playing tricks. Those wrenches are lined with scratch-preventing tape. The car was available with dual taillights, but in its day, uh, the requirements were only for one. Soon the project moved to the inside for upholstery design and fabrication. Here at Milton's, they gave the Duesenberg a classic look throughout the interior of the car. The original fabrics and materials we can purchase and we can reupholster it to the exact uh, design and criteria that goes in the original upholstery, same with the leather. Seats are pretty easy to make. Asses haven't changed much in the last 70 years. The interior was originally white, We've updated the interior a little bit. We've done it in what I call early bordello. This is reminiscent of what people would have done in the period. Women like this fancy brocade sort of work on the doors. So we just sort of brought it back a little bit, uh, make it a little fancier than it was. But make no mistake, it was pretty upscale when it was new. As you can see, you sat back here. It's a little warmer, I think, with this uh, peach colored interior than it would have been originally. You got a divider window there as well. There's your cigarette lighter right there and your ashtrays here and little pockets. Jump seats right here come out. Uh, as you see these jump seats come forward here like this and then they open up like that to take an extra passenger. Kind of interesting thing Herbert Hoover sat here and drove around. I never understood why nobody would want a window right here. If you want to look out you have to keep doing this but if you're a rich guy and you're sitting back here reading your Wall Street Journal or whatever everything else is pretty much standard Duesenberg. Uh, you know the big uh, seven liter engine, twin overhead cam, four valves per cylinder. Uh, very powerful car. Duesenbergs made good town cars because they were really powerful, they were fast, they could climb any hill. These had pretty low gearing in them because they really weren't meant to be highway cars. So we put a uh, 354 rear end in it so she'll go out and cruise nicely at 60 or 70 miles an hour. But uh, here, we'll show you some more of the restoration and then we'll take it for a ride. Well, today's the day, it's the moment of truth. It's what we've been working for for the last year. So we'll see what Jay says. <laughs> Jay? Hey, it looks great. What do you think? Cool, no, it looks terrific. No, that looks great. You know, the things we've changed, you know, it was missing, totally missing all of the running board rubber. We had to make all right, that. Right. We made the wheel covers. Uh, lights were damaged, we did that. One rear fender was rusted right through. I remember that, yeah, yeah. we took that off here. Yeah, the trunk rack, we had to make a new one because it had been hit several right. times before. So many parts in the engine compartment are new. Gas tank covers new. Right. Uh, you know, it's just, Amazing what all we had to do. There was wood gone, totally rotted through in the top uh, and in some of the sills. Of course, we refinished all the wood. Right. The interior was totally beyond use because of tire storage in it. Randy and his team have fully restored the Duesenberg to all of its former glory. This is why you always want to go to someone who's an expert in the field. Uh, although we do a lot of our own restoration stuff here, we do mostly the mechanical work. Randy. Uh, it's, it's like, you know those guys when you get the Rembrandt painting or something that's all screwed up and the guy takes a little thing, cleans it, and makes sure everything is perfect exactly as it should be. Well, that's what Randy does with these cars. He brings them back exactly as they should be and retains as much of the original patina yes. as, as we can, you know? When we got the car and we looked at the speedometer, it only showed 7,000. 
And when we tore the engine apart, it had been bored with new pistons, you right. know, and, and used quite a bit since that time. Plus the rear end was all new, uh, new parts in it had right. been replaced. So we started looking, we realized, no, this is not a low mileage car, this right. is a high mileage car. Right, right. Yeah, it was, it was pretty far gone. I mean, I think that's probably why it sat in the garage all those years is it didn't run. The amount of money to get it to run, although not as much as it is now, was still pretty astronomical sure, at any point time. in the day. Yeah, Duesenberg, Duesenbergs have never been cheap to fix. You have your, uh, you can check your oil right there for the Duesenberg. It's the dipstick moves back and forward that way, so you see it's full. When you want to drain the oil, just flip that switch and the oil comes out of the bottom. Uh, no air cleaner, because the air was much cleaner back in the 30s, I guess. Explain this here, this fuel pump. Well, the car has three pumps. Right. It has an electric pump back underneath, and that establishes the pressure, primes the carburetor, and maintains the pressure. You have a mechanical pump in this housing, which is a bellows, not a diaphragm, but a, a brass copper bellows. Mm -hmm. It works that. If it's sat, your battery's dead. The theory is you can hand pump it right. and then crank start it. Yeah, now, yeah, that's a yeah. lot more man than I think I'm capable yeah, yeah. of. If you but... can crank start this car, well, if you steal it, I'm not going to get in a fight with you. This is the bellows control for the shutters that opens and closes the louvers right. up front. At 140 degrees, they start to open. As you see, these louvers are open now, and as the car cools, they will close. And in the wintertime, you could probably drive around all day and they would stay would closed. Not even open. Uh, it's just an external thermostat, really. I like any cars that were ahead of their time in their time. And as I said before, in an era when most cars could barely go a mile a minute, and these went, well, look, it's right there, 130 miles an hour. I mean, that would be the equivalent today, I think, of a Ferrari or a ZR1 Corvette going 200 miles an hour. You know, the Duesenberg brothers, were race car designers and engineers. They won Indianapolis many times. And so when they built their luxury car, even though it was a luxury car, there was still enough race car engineering and race car suspension in there. And I'm sure a lot of chauffeurs had a lot of fun blowing the doors off everything on the road back in the day when they had these things. I am impressed with where it was to where it is now. It was, unfortunately, a very ugly, well-worn, abused, 50 years of abuse automobile, and it is now back to its grandeur. I'm excited. I'm glad to see it's back to him. Uh, you know, it's a little over a year and a half project, and we're glad it's done. This is a big car. Being a Duesenberg, of course, it's got plenty of power, but you never forget you're hauling a big box in back there. It's not the most comfortable Duesenberg to drive because it's made for a chauffeur, and they never wanted their chauffeur to be too comfortable, so my legs are a little all over the place. But the windshield opens and this top goes back. Uh, if you want to get the specifications on the Duesenberg motor, watch some of the other videos. We go into it a lot more depth. Since this is about the eighth Duesenberg we've done, just fascinating that a car like this could uh, last this long. You know, most Duesenbergs and most cars built with these town car bodies, they were not considered attractive. So whether you had a Bentley or a Duesenberg or whatever, people would take these chassis, throw the body away, and make a Le Mans replica or make an open car or just change the body to something they liked a little bit better. In fact, that Duesenberg chassis I have in my garage, this one here, we did a road test on it. That originally had a Willoughby big box sedan body on it, but uh, somebody took it off because they didn't like it. As Duesenbergs become rarer and rarer, obviously, over the years, suddenly everybody wants these now and they're desirable again. As you can see, this is a big, imposing automobile. You don't even want to try and parallel park this thing, but uh, hop in the back. We'll give you a little chauffeur ride. As you can see, we've got the sliding glass partition open. There's plenty of leg room in this thing. You've got your standard Duesenberg gauges. You've got your... Duesenberg was, of course, the first car to have hydraulic brakes, certainly the first American car. And you can adjust the brakes for dry, rain, snow, or ice. You turn this lever here and adjust how much fluid uh, more or less is in the system. So 
You can, uh, if you put it on ice, where you can stomp on the brakes and they won't lock up. Uh, pretty clever, kind of a primitive anti-lock system. This is your uh, advance and retard on the ignition. This is your hand throttle. This is your headlights, choke starter, temperature gauge, altimeter, oil, clock, brake pressure. Rather odd design, because you almost have to look down to look at the clock, because it's so far under the dash. But that's what custom bodybuilders did back in the day. Handbrake here, of course. But in true Duesenberg fashion, it's got plenty of power, especially once it's rolling. And you see, you got your interior lights, look up. I mean, all the stuff we take for granted now, that was considered like, ooh, a big deal back in the day. You got your interior lights, you can read the newspaper in the evening on the way home from work while your chauffeur drives. But yeah, these are just considered big old boxy cars back in the day. Uh, I'm trying to think what the equivalent would be. Maybe a big four-door Cadillac from the early 80s you wouldn't think that would be collectible now but in a few years somebody's going to want one of those and that's the way these were everybody liked the Duesenberg motor because of the power but they didn't want to drag around two tons of body work so it's nice that this one was preserved Randy did a beautiful job on this car as he does with all Duesenbergs and Randy of course a real historian he has all the original factory uh, drawings so you can be sure that your car is restored accurately Kind of funny to think I'm only the second owner of this car. And the thing is what, 80 years old? Pretty amazing. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this little trip down memory lane. Uh, it's fun to drive these unusual cars. You know, a lot of people don't say four-door cars or these kind of cars anymore. So it's fun to kind of preserve a piece of history like this. And it's fun being only the, the second owner of a car that's, my God, 80, 90 years old almost. So once again, thanks to Randy Ema and uh, We'll see you all next week.